I'm going to give a kind of a comprehensive program today about uh, what we can do, kind of look at the building blocks for, for corn and, and where I think that we're, where we've seen some issues and what our limitations are. This shows corn, the corn yield trends from our corn demonstration program in the last three years. And if you're not familiar with that, that's basically a hybrid, our county hybrid program. Um, and the yields have been going the wrong way. We had very high yields in 2014. 15, they dropped off considerably. Last year, they were off even a little bit further. The main factor that's influencing these yields, particularly on the irrigated corn, is the nighttime temperatures during that early reproductive period. And what I look at every year is the 30-day period from tasseling after that time period. In 2014, we were at 70 degrees for that period, which is normal. That year, we were two degrees above normal. This year we're about three and a half to four degrees above normal, which is very high historically. So the only reason I point this out is that we have a lot higher yield potential out there if we have better growing conditions during the growing season and those nighttime temperatures are key in that. So I'm using this yield triangle thing. I don't know if I've ever seen this before, but I developed this this year and been including it in, in the educational programs. Um, like they use the, the disease triangle the plant pathologists do. So I'm looking at different groups of things that are basically the building blocks for corn yields. You got hybrid selection and a few other things, crop rotation I had to include in there. No other better place to put it, I guess. Uh, but plant stand, planting date, plant density, plant uniformity. Um, we're gonna talk about growth variability as well, emergence variability in particular. Um, and crop nutrition. If you listen to any of the high yield guys, um, they'll talk about all of these different factors and how important they are and they want to address whatever is the limiting factor because if there are, if any of these are a limiting factor, it's going to reduce your overall yield potential. Um, so this is something that we've dealt with a lot the last four years. This is a real extension question. You all probably got these before too or, or certainly experienced some of this over the last several years. Will my corn come up? We've been having a lot of corn fields that come up, look like this, that we have a reduced plant population compared to the seeding rate. We've got late straggler plants coming up. Um, and uh, you've all probably heard, seen the information, or I know one of the presenters was talking about the Randy Dowdy flag test. We've been doing that for several years. In fact, we've presented some data here a couple years, well, actually in 2014, which means that we were working on it well before that. But this is your problem with those late emerging plants. Uh, we know that we have to use that information and assess a field situation like this in a replanting situation on more than just plant population. We need to look for late emerging plants and assign some value for those. I actually have a new graduate student that's working on a, a more detailed project looking at different patterns and different delays that simulate this actually doing a an advanced flag test and we should have some information available next year to help out with that um, but that's certainly an issue now one thing that I definitely want to talk about that's also a part of that graduate students project is replanting into a poor stand of corn and we've certainly had a lot of issues with replanting or certainly had a lot of replanting decisions to make the last few years and a lot of what the corn, corn growers do is, is plant into an existing stand. Now this happens to be a research plot, and that's probably a 50% stand there. We've got plots as low as 12% as well. But the problem is that when you replant that corn into the, into the existing stand, um, when you do that, generally the corn that you're planting into is a few inches tall, it may be four or five inches tall, it's V3 or V2, V3, maybe V4 growth stage, um, and then you're replanting into that, usually conditions are warm and that corn's gonna come up relatively quickly. But even if you have a three growth stage difference in corn, you're gonna have a huge difference in size of those plants when they get to these intermediate vegetative growth stages. So there's tremendous competition between those two plant stands right there. And what my graduate students research is showing is that if you plant into a clean stand, which is over here on the far left, and you see that's not 100%, you're gonna have some yield loss associated with the delayed planting. 
But any of these replanting methods where you're planting into a partial stand, whether you're uh, planting 50% into a 50% partial stand or um, replanting with a full stand into a 50% partial stand or any of these combinations, any of those are basically producing yields at least a, basically 11% less than what planting into a clean stand is. None of them are going to be equal to planting into a clean stand. So although we don't like to do it, it's certainly difficult to go out there with a, with a herbicide and kill a portion of the field or use a, you know, a gramoxone plus atrazine or a, or a select or, or even a Liberty, if it's not a Liberty Link hybrid, to go out there and kill that stand. We need to go out there and kill that stand and start over if we're forced with a replanting decision. And that's what that research shows. The whole field? <coughs> Well, it wouldn't necessarily have to be the whole field if you can selectively kill just part of the field, and it's normally going to be obviously in the lower part of the field or or uh, where you've had more water-related issues. But uh, it seemed like what we ran into this past spring, where we killed partial areas of the field, there was not enough pollen, if you will, and pollination was affected. Uh, we saw some yield drag in those, those areas. Yeah, I mean. There's a lot of reasons for pollination issues. Certainly having that later crop is going to cause some management issues if you're, if you're irrigating. Um, you're going to have different, different crop growth stages and you know, you'll have to irrigate for the later crop where you know, it may be only a portion of the field or sustain the irrigation across there. So that a lot of important decisions. And I know last year when my graduate student presented this to a public crowd including a lot of crop consultants he said well what about if you got 15 percent of your field that has a 50 percent stand what would you do well, we've got a treatment in the study and i'm not showing all the data but we've got treatments where we've got a 50 percent uniform stand 25 percent uniform stand even a 12 and a half percent uniform stand as well as all these other treatments, just for comparison's sake. The interesting thing was that we found that 50% stand produced 75% of your overall yield potential. So when you start comparing it to these numbers right here at about 85%, that makes that decision pretty easy. Definitely would not replant that. If you've only got 15% of your stand that has a 15 percent of your field that has a 50% stand or something like that, you know, you just I would suggest leaving it and you know you're only keep in mind you know if it's a 50 percent stand you're gonna make 70 75 percent of your overall yield potential certainly wouldn't replant the whole field question is Trent? there a date cutoff date where that was talked about balance like last year i had a case where a guy planted a mixed heavy land low area like i said very weak coming up i don't yeah. know what percentage was but because it stayed wet so long we were probably the first week of May, and he yeah. finally decided he's going to replant. I tried to get him to go in and kill this corner of the field and, and just start from scratch, even though it was that late. Yeah. He elected to go ahead and plant into what he has, and year monitor showed we were cutting 190, 180, 190 under a pivot on mixed heavy land, where we had a good adequate stand, and where he did up the replant into the standing corn, it dropped off, you know, 30, 40 bushels. Is, yeah. there, a, is there a date? that you would say, okay, yeah, this is going to balance out where well, we won't be losing the, the planning date is definitely going to have an impact on your, on that number right there, as well as all of these. I would think, obviously, the earlier you get replanted, the better. Absolutely. But, like I'm saying, if we're, if we're that late, rain delays, we can't get in there and get it killed, can't get in there and get it replanted, yeah. are you still, do you still want to go ahead and, and clean it up? All these numbers are going to be lower. Everything on this chart right. is all replanted stuff. Okay. We've had numbers in 2015. We re were, all our planting dates were a little bit later. Our normal right. planting date was say somewhere in mid to late April. Our replanting date was sometime in mid May. So when we get that time period, yeah. our replanted optimal yields are going to be about 90 percent or somewhere in that range. All these are going to be lower, but that. That 50% stand we were talking about, you know, about his question, it's still going to be 75%. So that definitely plays a role as well in your replanting decision. Eric, I think one thing too is this 
if you could predict what the weather was going to do, because you can't necessarily, you may not get a stand with a second planting either. Then you're in no, real no. trouble. Yeah. So it's, it's nothing's it's guaranteed. Tough, this is a very tough de decision. Yeah. We got an area last year that had to replant it three times. Yeah. You got one area that's tasseling and then one area that's yeah, how do you spray fungicide and where I'm from we have a lot of stink bug issues and it's hard to Yeah. It does do cause it. some management issues, particularly with the irrigation, but you know, occasionally with Yeah. Hopefully it's not that big a disparity like you're talking about normally. Hopefully maybe only one year out of a hundred. I hope I hope so. <laughs> Traditionally it's been you know, if you didn't get a stand of corn, you go back and plant another crop, I yeah, guess. Beans. But uh, things are changing. Um, we're, we're using that higher level of management with corn, and hopefully we've got some data to help address some of those questions. Um, one of the other questions that we've had a lot of associated with those wet conditions is tire traffic compaction. Um, very visible in this situation. It isn't always that visible. But oftentimes you see these patterns out through the field every 12 rows if it's a 12 row pattern where you see a dip in the field and that is sustained all the way through the season. What I wanted to point out here is there's your, there's your basically where the dual wheels are centered up. There's the height of those rows. There's where the corn should be. Um, but look at the other rows that are on the edges of those patterns. You actually have stunted corn and effects of that that tractor traffic pattern over as many as six rows out of those 12. It's not just a couple rows out of there and uh, you know that has serious consequences. Um, you know Trent talked a lot about compaction in his program and um, that's important I guess and something that you can see from the soil moisture sense. As I also point out that where we don't have a soil compaction zone, how deep you think corn roots are normally taken up? Or how, how deep are they progressing through the soil profile during the year? And how, how deep are they using water and nutrients and everything that they do? Every case where you don't have soil compaction, they're basically going to the bottom of those sensors. 34, 36 inches every time, believe it or not. So when you limit, what root zone you have and that was one of the first questions I got you know from a consultant several years ago Trent when we come up we started putting soil moisture sensors in and the, the consultant said well uh, you know why do we have to have roots that go 18 inches deep yeah. at that time period of the year we were arguing about making an early season irrigation at VA like somebody asked here and uh, the farmer was freaking out because his corn was wilting up and we were saying you know you got all kinds of moisture out there it's at field capacity 12 inches deep, it's not a soil moisture limitation. 14 was the prime example of that. I mean, it stayed wet uh, through June into July. Yeah. And early season, as soon as it turned off hot, hot, sun broke out, that corn would twist a little bit. It just rained two inches three days before. Yeah. You know you're not sure. Absolutely. Um, other things that we experienced last year that were relatively unique, I wanted to talk about this. We've had a growing trend particularly in the Mississippi Delta, to use top dressed urea either in a supplemental application prior to tassel. Uh, we've got folks on the program down here talking about putting uh, UAN out in wide drops on top of the ground. Just be aware that those urea fertilizer sources are subject to volatility loss. So you'd certainly want to treat them with a NBPT product like Agritain that helps protect from volatility. But what happens when you have three and a half weeks of dry weather during the growing season and you have you're putting out hundred percent of your nitrogen in that form of fertilizer number one it's not going to be incorporated in the soil where the crop can use it and number two those products are going to wear off and you're going to have considerable losses as well particularly after 20 days after 20 days the normal research shows what Wayne 15 20 percent as high as 50 though loss so it depends on the, the the moisture the temperature and the ph it can be as high as 70. Um, but the losses are significant so just be aware of those risks with those fertilizers and that application method and uh, 
be aware that there are significant advantages with injecting liquid UAN into the soil and uh, yeah there's lots of advantages of, of improving your timing uh, the wide drops certainly improve your efficiency of getting across the field but there are risks associated with those fertilizer products and application methods too so something you need to be aware of particularly with a crop like corn that uses as much nitrogen as it does um, very similar picture to what uh, Trent showed earlier. And the key points that I wanted to point out, you see them over there. Number one, corn is not very sensitive to water deficits at this time period. Um, your water uptake chart is a bell-shaped chart just like this. This is actually a sensitivity chart as opposed to a water use chart. But when you see a chart like this, um, I think that there's a strong justification to use a different threshold for triggering irrigation scheduling during the growing season and it's very common you know I, I've talked about this for several years and when we run the soil moisture sensors in our verification fields we'll get stuck oftentimes you know doing the same thing through the growing season um, but this chart basically shows that there's strong justification to use a much lower threshold at this time period of the year and certainly a, a, a little bit lower as you approach at the tail end of the year too. Your crop water use is not only tailing off significantly, but the crop can tolerate water deficits much better at those stages too. So early on there's a lot of negative impact associated with soil saturation, stunning that crop, uh, causing nutrient loss, um, prohibiting those roots from getting as deep as what they could so that you have a better resource and pool of resources available later in the year. One of the questions I get relative to that and trying to convince folks to do that is, well, what about if I have some water deficit during the time period when that corn is wilting and it's that tall. Um, this chart right here goes back to this data from our corn hybrid demo. These are strip trials conducted all, all across the state. What we do is select two sets of hybrids. One goes in dry land locations, the other goes in irrigated locations. What I did with this data is select the common hybrids that get planted in both irrigated and dry land locations. And the yield component that's determined during the time period when the corn is about this high is the number of kernel rows around the ear. We collect that data every year in our demonstration program plots. So this is a summary of what we're showing. We actually have slightly less kernel row development in our irrigated <coughs> plots than what we do dry land plots that don't get any irrigation water. What does that tell you? Water stress early. What kind of water stress? Too much water, if anything. It's certainly not killing us, if anything, um, having a slightly drier environment is helping us in terms of plant growth and development of that plant in terms of kernel row development during the early part of the season. So the general trend is certainly to irrigate, you might say, too liberally, particularly during that early part of the season. And this, this helps to justify that based upon some real tangible numbers that are determined during those growth stages during the growing season. I'll stop right there. Those are my kids and they certainly got plenty of questions, but <laughs> I know we're probably late on time, but if y'all got any questions, I'll be happy to talk to you or I'll be around all day through tomorrow too so where do you catch that fish <laughs> <laughs> down south of here actually yeah that was uh down close to where ronnie levy was talking about golden meadow area actually in louisiana my kids never had been down there so they carried me my wife decided to take we decided to take the whole family down there for my 50th birthday so that's just a big one time. comment, Eric. One of the things that, that kind of gets missed in the talk about the moisture and stuff is 
aeration. Yeah. You know, not having giving time for the ground to dry out enough that you get good aeration affects nutrient uptake. So, you know, having the ground wet all the time, you know, it, it's not just a moisture related thing, but also aeration. And that's where some of our farmers that water really early get into trouble because that's also maximum nutrient up, uptake time. And if the ground's saturated, aeration is a big issue there. And the question earlier was, are you seeing the ground seal over with multiple irrigations? And yes, the model case. And that's an I've got evidence of that and didn't present anything that much up today, but when they start early like that, they're sealing that soil over so quick. By the third irrigation, we rarely penetrate six to 10 inches on that seal bone soil. Rarely. And the only thing we've seen penetrated, Andrew can test this, is about three inch rain. Slow. You can you can irrigate it back to back like we did and, and, and affect it. But on those real tight soils, you know, you don't ever see it penetrate down there below 18 to 20 inches unless yeah. you get a really big rain again you know, once they've sealed over. Corn definitely likes a moderate environment, moderate temperatures, moderate soil moisture. Certainly goes along with that. So it's one of the, <laughs> one, of the <laughs> one of the inherent things associated with our fur irrigation events is that generally we do have soil saturation after it. So I see it more. Yes.